So I'm, I'm an economist, that's my disclaimer, and I'd like you to suspend your scepticism <laughs> for the next uh, 20 minutes while I talk through uh, discrete choice experiments. Um, I'm a health economist based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, my own work is on HIV prevention, mostly in South Africa, but this is a method that's been applied uh, all over the place. Um, and it, it's based on this premise that economists really value choices. So the multitude of ways to elicit what, are, what is important to people and what are the factors that drive people's behaviour. Economists believe that there's value in the choices that people make. The reason being... So the resources are scarce, your time is limited, your budget is limited, and actually the choices you make given those constraints is really informative about what people value. But how do we observe them? So we're trying to elicit people's preferences, we're trying to work out how people make decisions that they do make, and, and to sort of rush through really, economists have two, two ways of doing this. So we have our revealed preferences of a survey normally going and saying, well, what did you do? So when you were coming to Bath today, did you get the train, did you drive, did you cycle, what did you do? A stated preference would say, well, actually, given a new cycle path, given a new train line, a cheaper car, what would you do? Given this change in an environment, this hypothetical choice, um, what would you do then? Um, and there's obviously pros and cons for both of these things, that when you're observing what people actually do, there's a great deal of faith validity because people are actually doing it. Um, and it's quite simple to analyse. You just ask people, well, what did you do? It's quite difficult to have the alternatives that people face, though. So I, got, I drove here today, um, but I could have got the train, I could have walked, I could have, I could have unicycled. But actually, not all of those things are in my, uh, the function of, of goods that I choose to come here. Um, and actually, more prescient is that you can only look at what the choices people have made. So given a different policy environment or given a different set of, uh, a different construction of those choices, you don't know what people would, would choose. So discrete choice experiments are really based on this idea of stated preference, this hypothetical group of methods that say, um, given this new set of choices, how would you choose them? So they're quite flexible. You can look at important trade-offs for things that don't exist. So a lot of my work is among HIV prevention and different HIV prevention methods, um, specifically looking at new biomedical prevention methods of tablets and gels, and looking at what is it about these products that are really important to people, but these things don't exist, and people know nothing about these products in the context of HIV prevention. But people do know what an injection is, people do know what a tablet is, and you can imagine that situation, you can imagine that choice task to give you a starting point of how to consider these, uh, the rollout of these goods. The obvious con is that um, your external valid validity is impinged, it's a hypothetical choice, there's a hypothetical bias. There's actually a surprising, surprisingly small amount of literature in this field about how well uh, these things reflect reality. We're getting better in the last few years. Um, and the answer is they, they mostly reflect reality, but in, in quite important circumstances, don't. Okay. So I, I was told to not to put any... Greek letters in, but um, I got a Greek philosopher in instead. Aristotle, the big man, says the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but the economists tear this to pieces. We say the whole is exactly the sum of the parts. Um, this chap, Calvin Lancaster, is the father of, of consumer economics and microeconomics, and, and it's, it's almost a semantic point that actually the total you get, the utility you gain from a product. Is, is the sum of the individual utilities provided by the attributes of that good. <coughs> attributes we're talking about, you don't, value, um, you don't value buying a new car, you don't value the car itself, you value, it, value its potential to get you to places, its colour, uh, its safety, all of these attributes of the product, we value not the car itself. And I say not a semantic point because it links in, when we do these things hypothetically, it links into how we present them to people. So I was trying to think of an example, and I'd, you'll see in a minute this, this slide has changed slightly over the last few weeks. Um, <laughs> I postulate a discrete choice experiment for Brexit. <laughs> so we've got a clear choice, in or out. And we can describe this by some characteristics of choosing one or the other. That we can have a look at the economic impact, we can have a look at the effect on migration, and uh, this, this particularly changed quite recently. Uh, yeah. 
who would be your, your prime minister as a result. So we call this a choice task. We'd ask you to choose whether you're in or out according to these characteristics. Now, actually, these characteristics down here are controlled by there's an underlying statistical design, and they change around. So you, you're not really valuing the good at the top. Like I said, it's the attributes that make up um, that choice. And what we do, we show people, we ask some people to choose one or the other, in or out, with this particular set of uh, attributes, and then we change it up a bit. And again, this changed quite recently. We've, uh, so you can see, just flicking between these two slides, we've got a slight change in GDP, we've got a slight change in net migration, and we've got Michael Gove rather disturbingly turning into Theresa May. Um, and something stays the same. But we, once we do this over a series of tasks, we can see how people are making their choices with these changing attributes. So once we do this eight or nine times, we see how people are choosing between the two and infer what is important to them according to our underlying design of those changes. Okay, so this is just a couple of examples really of what we've been doing. This is part of the work I mentioned in South Africa, looking at new prevention products. Um, so we've got our products along the top of an injection, a tablet, a diaphragm and a gel and a condom. We've got an attribute of HIV protection that... Um, doesn't vary too much on this slide, but varies a lot in the rest of the experiment. And we've got a contraceptive property. There's a few other things we use, but as an example, this is um, part of the application. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Another nice one, perhaps for this audience, this is around essay cheating. So you see these little tags around universities of, I'll write you a first class essay in three weeks. It'll cost you 200 quid. Um, people did some work looking at people's preferences for this, what's important to people um, if you were thinking about buying one of these things. And I think this is, a, this is a good example of why the hypothetical nature is good to explore some of these things where um, other research methods of trying to interview people who <coughs> had got caught and trying to elicit what made them um, choose one provider over another or to cheat or not to cheat perhaps becomes quite mixed. So they're quite, ad they're quite adaptable tools. I mean, there's... there's a pretty big context already. Okay, a quick thing about what we get out of them. The biggest thing we get out of them is, is what's the most important uh, attributes or set of attributes from these things. So from our Brexit example, we could find out that, uh, that migration might be a strong indicator of people's choice, or the Prime Minister might be a strong indicator of people's choice. <coughs> the value that the, the discrete choice experiments give in an economist's opinion, over another method of working out what's important to people is you get a quantitative estimate of how preferences vary across things. An example of this is you could say that immigration matters twice as much as the effect on an economy. You get a sense of the relative trade-offs people are making because you're forcing people to make a choice. You get a sense of um, a bit of, once they scratch their heads, where their preferences would really lie. Another useful thing, particularly when we're looking at these new products, for example, is that you can forecast um, demand. In the marketing literature, people call it a market share. To rather stretch the Brexit analogy, it's how many people will vote leave. Aggregated across our sample, how would those choices reflect? Um, and just a quick example from health. Um, doesn't translate very well to a presentation, but this is a choice between two, two products up here, and once you've done your experiment, once you get people's preferences for your utilities, you can see, well, what if we change the price? What if we increase the price by 10%? Um, what if effectiveness got, got worse amongst some people? How would demand change? And actually, this is, I wouldn't get too, too caught up in the detail of this, but you can model changing a policy, changing a price, changing an attribute, how that would affect your uptake and your preferences uh, relative to each other. And finally, quite an important thing in health economics that um, economists love observing behaviour in a market, but health is not a market. But when we're trying to put a value on a new medicine or trying to look at the effect of a new medicine and whether something is cost-effective, we need to know what cost-effective means to people. Um, so methods like these are used to value the benefit you would gain from a drug or a service or a, um, a particular treatment. Um, and again, stretching the example is, is looking at this trade-off between GDP and, and migration, but in drugs it would be effective. The, the classic example is a drug could extend your life by one year, how much would you be willing to pay? And with that information you can compare across different drugs and different 
context to work out if something is cost effective according to society as a whole. So as I mentioned, a, a bit of a, a whistle-stop tool, um, and I, I, I must admit I did ask you to suspend your disbelief. I've, I, I, there, there are certainly limitations with these things, but they do, your advantages are very policy relevant, and albeit the dashboard is quite complicated on here, but actually it's quite an intuitive thing. You can show someone that screen of those choices, and it's quite an intuitive thing of I know which one I choose, and then you look at the next one, and I know one I choose. You kind of see how your choice depends on the attributes that matter to you. Um, so you can get some quite policy relevant information out. The results are relatively easy to model with, with a few Greek letters, and um, they are quite easy for participants to understand. I mean, we did a, we, um, we put these on tablet computers and took them around Johannesburg, and, and, and people flew through them. I mean, people really understood the trade-offs that they were, we were asking them to make, and actually they... Um, the technology was, was really useful and was really uh, applicable to this um, type of research. The obvious main disadvantage is uh, there's some hypothetical choices, so we can tentatively say a limited external validity. There's increasing evidence that these things mostly reflect the choices that people would make in reality. Um, and they are a very simplified and simplistic approach to choices. I would say that when you design one of these things, when you decide what goes in, what are your attributes, and how do you present them to people, there's an enormous amount of, um, I hesitate to say qualitative, because that's a loaded term, I think, in the room. I would describe it as qualitative research to work out what matters to people, how you present stuff, what people are interpreting from what you're putting in front of them. There's a lot of research in psychology about presenting risk, um, presenting money, and, and organizing these things in different, in different ways. There's a great deal of testing. I think about 80% of the work is designing working out your question and working out how you present it to people. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on that. And they, they can be a bit complex to design and analyze. And, and actually, the best DCE are the hardest. They're cognitively demanding. So the best one really forces you to choose between some, some difficult options. Um, because that's when you get the most information about what people are valuing and how people are trading off between different bits of information. I think I'm I think I've under time. So thank you very much. <laughs>